the company of curlews. Chapter 4 The Anku When a Heart is Broken The stories my dada would tell on those long winter nights scared the pants off us. He knew it. In a dark, dark wood, he would say, way down past the slow-moving bends of the majestic river there lived at Purti, the darkest corner of the river, a devil that watched the graveyards of the village, a henchman of death, an anku. He would be so dramatic. I'd look across at Dai. He'd be there with his goggling eyes, dropped mouth. I was fishing down there one dark night with my grandfather, he went on, and heard in the distance the grinding of iron wheels. I said to him, Is that a train slowing down coming over the bridge from Pembroke Dock? There are no trains, he said to me. Not at this time of night, good boy. They are the wheels of the Anku's barrow, seeking out the dead of the night. Dai is listening good and gasps. Oh! Every time we heard the story, his reaction was the same. Oh! oh. The anku of the Tawi is as dark as the thief's pocket. Around him a black shroud of a cloak made him look like an enormous bat with wings stretching out. A skeleton of a ghoul with red bloodshot eyes burning like embers in a coal fire. The thing is, my dada wouldn't do the actions. He would just let us listen. And in fact... I was there. I was carried away in my imagination to that dark, distant place. He sheltered in the cave down on Greencastle Corner. Across the entrance there was a stone that blocked the anku escaping for a whole year. Until the bells of Rangine Church rang out and welcomed in the new year. Then the stone would mysteriously move and the monster would be released. It would then scour the countryside for the last dead of the year. It needed to find someone to take its place before dawn and become the new Anku. Because if he didn't, he would be trapped once again to be imprisoned behind the rock for another year. Through the night the Anku flew back and forth over Pulti. Now, my grandfather paused for effect. Now, there was a coracle man out fishing in the dark of the night. He had wandered down to Pulti. No, said Dai, fearing the worst. And the cold wind was gusting from the east, and the reeds were hissing and rustling in the streams. The branches of the trees on the steep bank were muttering, and the large oaks were creaking in the wind. It didn't matter about the weather to this coracle man. He was going fishing all alone with his rod and line. An owl passed, escaping from the trees and stared at our man as he flew overhead. The fisherman didn't know the spell of the owl that the death bird had cast upon him. A great shadow came over the face of the river. The man thought it was the clouds darkening, but when he looked up at the sky, I looked across the dike. He was away with the fairies, fast asleep. 
and that I could see I was distracted, and he pulled me back to the story by lowering his voice. And when he looked up to the sky, he was enveloped by the great Anku, who in a flash would use his wings to trap the fisherman and haul him up and throw him inside the cave. The stone went across, a new Anku for a new year. I'm 13, going on 14, and since my brother died, I've slept in with my uncle Di. Mum has her own bedroom. She's living on her nerves these days, not always there. Shakes a lot, especially when she's pouring the tea. Nana Lol looks after us, really. She does all the cooking and washing. A trooper she is. Mum likes her bedroom. It was June the 18th, 1954. I remember it well. Rocky Marciano retained the world heavyweight title, beating Ezad Charles in 15 rounds. They reckoned Rocky had the biggest punch of them all. We'd heard reports on our radio, the one my dad had bought from Richards, the new electrical shop in town. My nana Lol was the boss. She wanted a new radio, and she had what she wanted. She loved listening to the boxing. That same night, an electrical storm hit the town, with a flurry of heavyweight punches, if you like. It had been difficult to sleep in the mugginess of the night, and then a big one, a huge clap of thunder. My bed trembled, bolted me to sit upright. Oh, it's a big one, I called out from my dream. I looked over to die. He was snoring quietly, still dreaming of the fish that we just caught, probably. I pulled back the curtains to watch the heavens light up. Well, well, well. It was wow. I heard and saw the combination of light with the thunder. I counted the seconds. It was four miles away. You could hear the storm moving up river. You knew it was coming. An enormous crack, a body punch to my stomach. It was on us. No counting. I think I ducked when I heard it. it was so close. I heard a door slam. Thought at first it was another thunderclap. But no. It was my mother running out of the house. No shoes, no coat. Just a nightie. Thought I was still dreaming. I went straight to my dada. Nana Lol shook him up. He was like die he was. Slept through the storm. I told him what I'd seen. You go now, Jack, my grandfather said. As fast as you can, I'll follow. She'll have gone down to the river looking for your father. Sleepwalking she is, be quick, good boy. At the river, the sheet lightning of the storm lit up the boats hugging the quayside, clutching on tight to their rope moorings. I was bobbing, weaving up and down the waterfront, searching, desperate to find my mam. Again the sheet lit up the key. There she was, silhouetted against the black river. Her hands hung by her side. She slowly moving towards the steps to take her down to the river. Mam, I called, so happy to find her. But where was my dada? What shall I do next? Mam, come on, mam, you'll catch a cold down here. It's over, my love. She wasn't talking to me. I'm coming, she said. I didn't know what to say, did I? Uh, yes, ma'am, the war is over. It's over. She swayed as if drunk and started wobbling down the steps. Uh, ma'am, I said, I'm hungry. The words stopped her in her tracks. Will you make me some breakfast, please, Mum? I asked. 
she stared at me silently. How about some salty bacon, ma'am? Can I have two eggs? Some fried bread? She broke out the smallest of smiles. You're a greedy one, Jack Bach. And as she did, Dadder arrived with towels for the two of us. Hilary Cariad, he said. There's no need for all this. He swept her up in his arms, put a towel over her head and carried her home. Everything'll be all right, he said. The kettle was boiling on the hot plate and the teapot waiting on a trivet on the kitchen table. You, says Nana Lol, pointing at me. Upstairs, get your mamma blanky. Owen, she points at him, put a lady here next to me. Get your breath back, then you can top up the pot. I'll have a fresh one too. Use the honey, she says. When I come back downstairs, Nana Lol is wrapped around my mother, cocooning her on the sofa. She sings the sweet lullaby suogan. My mother grumbles, then gives in. Nana Lol always sang it when Anthony was a baby, and now she rocks my mother gently, singing the first verse. After the death of my father during the war, my mother, looked after by his parents in their home, couldn't cope with the shock of his death and with two babies, I saw her fall into the deepest depression you could think of. When Anthony drowned, it tipped her over even further. She was committed to that hospital on the hill, never came out until she was carried out in her coffin. I'm not aware of what she died of. My dad would always tell me, she died of a broken heart, good boy. <laughs>